in the first bracha of Shlon Esra. We say, Elokeinu, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu, Elokeinu, we say, then we go somewhere else. Why do we not say Melech HaOlam? So the Sefer Orthos Chaim explains a very interesting thing. He says that's a misconception. That's the format for certain types of brachos. There's other types of brachos we make. There's a bracha on food. There's a bracha on the greatness of nature. Those are two categories of brachos. So those are brachos in which we recognize God's dominion over the world, right? If I'm thanking God for my glass of water, of course I'm recognizing these melech ha'olam. If I'm thanking God for the, or I'm struck by the wonder of thunder or lightning, I'm recognizing these melech ha'olam. There's another type of bracha that I make on a mitzvah, right? So I, if, if I'm doing this commandment because you are the master of the universe and gave you this commandment, so of course you're melech ha'olam, you're the king of, the master of the universe. Shmon Esrei is something totally different. Shmon Esrei is we're just coming to God and we're just making requests of Him. Now, in the weekday Shmon Esrei, particularly the middle section of the weekday Shmon Esrei, those are very specific requests. In the Shabbos and Yom Tov Shmon Esrei, those are more requests of a nature that God should help us sanctify ourselves and give us sources of inspiration and things of that sort. But it's very interesting to think about that Shmon Esrei is a whole different mode. Shmon Esrei is coming before God, not thanking him for X, or because we have to talk to you, but it's coming before God because we, we want him to help us, and presumably we want to cultivate more of a relationship with him. It's a different type of thing. Or if Chaim says that. Okay, let, let's kind of move along. Baruch to Hashem. Another famous thing, by the way, that generally speaking, when it says the word Baruch, the classic commentators explain that Baruch means that God is a source of abundance, that we realize that everything we have is from you. Baruch to Hashem. Elokeinu ve'elokei avosein. Our God and the God of our fathers. Where do our fathers come into this? And then, by the way, we go, Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak, ve'elokei Yaakov. And then we continue our praises of God. So why are we talking about the forefathers anyway? So the Mabit explains that when we stand before our Baruch Hu, we realize that the whole mode of our relationship with him is a continuation of the great patriarchs and matriarchs at the beginning of, of, of the history of the Jewish people. And actually this bracha is known as avos, as the bracha of the, of the fathers, meaning that we highlight our connection to him through the previous generations. And there's a famous idea that Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov meant that a person who met an Avraham, as Rabbi Goldberger mentioned before, these people were giants, a person who met an Avraham they would appreciate that there was a God in the world. A person met Yitzchak, a person met Yaakov, and for different reasons, for different aspects of their character. But in any event, we relate to God as not just Elokeinu, but also Elokei Avoseinu. I'm not, I'm not a, a newbie in this. I'm coming on the heels of, of, of generations of great people. And the Mabit says something very different. The Mabit says, you know something? Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, they were all tremendous. There's a lot of great people since then until this generation. You know something? There's a lot of people that have not been perfect between us and them. And you know what? God was their God too. <laughs> it's a very, it's, it says both possibilities. Both the Lokei Abosainu refer to the, the famous patriarchs, matriarchs, and Lokei Abosainu might just refer to previous generations. But either way, whether we're tremendous, whether we're just okay, whether we're, which is what for all of us, we're just kind of going along our own paths with our strengths and weaknesses. He's all of our gods. It's another way of thinking about it. Okay. Great, mighty, awesome. There's a lot of discussion as to what the significance is of these specific adjectives. Um, without getting into detail, there are commentators that connect these adjectives to Psukim in God's relationship with the patriarchs, so that, that that's part of the significance, possibly. Um, there's also, I believe, where, where Shimon Schwab says, how Kael Hagadol, that Kael is a language of might, but it's also a language of, of God's abundant kindness. Kael Hagadol, just the abundant source of kindness for us in our lives. And he can do awesome things, and he can do mighty things. 
but before anything else, it's a, a source of kindness for us. Kelogo, a lofty, you see translates in the art scroll, the supreme God, Elion, like above. Also something that fits into comments made today. Rav Shimon Schwab writes, which by the way, if we're talking about books, there's an art school book by Rav Schwab on prayer. It's excellent. Uh, it's it's uh, very analytic in, in terms of the language, but if, if, if people are looking for that, it's, it's a wonderful book. It's, it's in English. Art scroll, Rav Schwab on prayers. I think that's the creative title. Um, Kelo Yom means a, a lofty God. Rav Schwab says, we have no idea why he does what he does. There are many things that we don't understand. He's Kelo Yom. He's above us. He's beyond us. Gomel Chasadim Tovim. He who does good acts of kindness. Most acts of kindness are probably good. So what, what's added by the language of Chasadim Tovim? Good acts of kindness. This is a very interesting question. The, the classic commentator that Udraham explains that the kindnesses that he does for us are so much better than the kindnesses we do for each other. In other words, our basic, we, we have a basic sense of chesed, but God's kindnesses are chasadim tovim, like, like of an abundant and ultimate good. On, on a basic level, the vast majority of us, when we do an act of kindness, subconsciously, at the very least, there's some type of string attached. Right? In other words, I do good for you, and I, I you know, at some level, I hope you'll do good for me. Or maybe I'm doing good for you because you've done good for me. And that's wonderful. We're human beings. God's chasadim are chasadim tovim. Rav Schwab says something very interesting. Rav Schwab says that he does kindnesses for us that through these kindnesses, <coughs> we're able to do kindness for others. In other words, if he gives us a talent, or he gives us an ability, or he gives us a resource, then he's helped us. But if we see ourselves as vehicles in this world, he, by extension, is helping other people. That's a chesed tov. Okay. Um, one more comment from the Avudram here. Gomel chasadim tovim is in the <laughs> present tense. Gomel doesn't mean he did do kindness. Gomel doesn't mean he will do kindness. Gomel means he does do kindness. Now, in the last phrase, we were talking about how he was the God of our forefathers. Right? In the following phrase, we're talking about he's mevi goel nevnehem. He's going to bring a redeemer to the descendants. So we're kind of flowing in between past and future, and here we are in this phrase stuck in the middle. Gomel chasadim tovim that he does acts of kindness. So the Abu Draham suggests that the significance of that present tense is it's to connect two points. In the same way that we understand that God has done great kindness for patriarchs, matriarchs, as individuals, God has, great, has done great kindness for our nation, that same God does kindness for us today and ultimately do us the ultimate kindness of redeeming our people. But it's all part of the same thread, and that's why it's in the present tense. Gomel chasadim tovim v'konei hakol. And he owns everything. He, he, he's the master of everything, but it's not just that he's the master, he is the acquirer of everything, which connotes that he is the creator of everything, which runs to the fact that we believe God created the world. The Rashba has such an interesting additional nuance to this word kone. He connects kone to a khan. A khan is a nest. <coughs> So you imagine the mother creating the nest for the chick. And every twig is only there because the mother decided to create this nest. And that is so in our world and in our personal lives too. Everything. Everything that's there was there by design of God. And that's the nest. That he, he owns everything, he has acquired everything, but it all, it all runs back to God. Vizokher chasteavos. He remembers the kindness of, of the forefathers. It's, it's a remarkable thing. We believe that when God views the Jewish people, God doesn't just view us as freestanding entities. God views us as a united nation. We have to view ourselves as a united nation, but God views us as a united nation. And God sees in us the great people from whom we come. And so when he looks at us, 
he remembers the kindness of the previous generations. And he brings, also in the present tense, he brings the Redeemer to their grandchildren for the sake of his name with love. Um, also, maybe apropos of Yerushalayim, Rav Schwab says the significance of saying he brings the redemption is every single occurrence, every single thing that happens in, in, in the national existence of Cloud Israel is for the purpose of bringing us closer to the ultimate redemption. We might not understand it. We might not see how that, how that works. But it all, whether or not the redemption happens today, it's all moving in that direction. And then, we're really near the end of the bracha now, Melech Oser Umoshia Umogen. This is, there's a lot being said here. He's a king who helps and saves and acts as a shield. It sounds like the same thing three times. So the Rashba says you have many people in this world who try to help. Right? Many, many people try to help, and it's very lovely that they try to help. Some people are successful in their, in their wishes, and some people uh, never are able to help out the way they wanted to. So God is not only Ozer, God is Moshia. And God is not only a helper who wants to help, God actually is a savior. Because when, when God decides to get in, he's in. And he can always succeed. Again, sometimes, as someone made a comment during the break, it's very true, not all Tfilos, not all Tfilos bring about the results that we're looking for. But God, we believe that God he has the ability to do so. And he is the Moshia. He is, if he wants to, if, if it's appropriate, he can absolutely save us. And Magain, the Rashba says, is he acts as a complete shield. And the example the Rashba gives is the image of Avram Avinu, of the patriarch Abraham going into the fiery furnace and just being there in the fiery furnace and surviving. And, and again, when you think about our national existence, the comment has been made by so many. If you look at the Jewish people, why should we still be around? And, and the, the odds are that we, have, we don't even know half of why we should still not be around. But God knows. And God has, has, has done great miracles for us. And God continues to do great miracles for us. So he has a desire to help us. He can successfully help us. And he's a tremendous shield for us, maybe in ways that we don't even appreciate. And Baruch HaTu Hashem, Magain Avraham. So we again recognize that God is the, is the source of all good. And we recognize him as being the shield of Abraham. Presumably it mentions Abraham because he was the first of the patriarchs. And he was the one who found God. And our whole relationship with God is, 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 is a follow through from Avram's original relationship with God. And that's this first breath of Shmon Esrei. And that if a person, again, you talk about concrete goals, if a person resolved that once a day, once a week, they would really say this bracha with real thought and reflection. And again, the, 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 the bracha highlights how much God does for us, and the bracha highlights how much we see ourselves as part of the chain. These are all specific thoughts. Um, this is a very, a very special bracha to reflect on. Um, if I could just maybe uh, close with one story. This is all for the first bracha. If it's all right, Stuart, I have a few minutes, if that's okay. So if I could just, if I could just close with one story, uh, I'm sure some people have heard this story from me before. The, the issue of, humbly, I think what tefillah is really about, and many people have said it far better than I can today, that, that uh, it's really about making God part of our lives. That's really what we were talking about in this first bracha, that we're connected to God as earlier generations were connected to God. When I was a high school teacher, there was a student in my class who was having a, a very, very hard time. He had a lot of bones to pick with God. He was living a very difficult life, of no fault of his own. And uh, we had davening in school, and this boy would check in and sit there and not say a word. And uh, I, I was his kind of a primary teacher. I did not feel it was even appropriate to try to convince him to daven because it was very clear there was a lot of other things going on and then why he was not saying a word during davening. Okay, you know, everyone has to, their, own, their own way, their own time. I was once talking to my class about davening, 
And this boy raised his hand and he said, you know, I'm on the school's baseball team. I said, okay. He said, I, you know, you probably notice I don't daven much, but there is one time that I occasionally daven. When, when we have a baseball game, I daven that morning that it shouldn't rain. <laughs> and he asked me, is that okay? And I told him, that's great. And, 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 and by the way, just think about it. Think about it for a second. The kid didn't daven that he should hit a home run. In other words, he wasn't, to be very blunt, he wasn't comfortable putting that much in God's hands because he had felt that God had, again, from his perspective, God had given him somewhat of a raw deal. But to daven that it shouldn't rain, he felt that's something he could ask of God. You know what? Akadosh Baruch just wants us to ask. Mm -hmm. There are so many things, you know, Rabbi, Rabbi Goldberger was, was talking before about reflection before davening. And I don't know, maybe what I'm about to say is a bad suggestion. I, everyone's different. I like to think about sometimes, I, I wish I would do this regularly in davening, maybe I need to do it, something for me to think about. I like, I like to think about sometimes when I'm going to an important meeting, in the minutes before the meeting, maybe if I'm in my car or I'm waiting in my office, I'm, I kind of am reviewing in my mind some core points that I, I remind myself I need to bring up at this meeting, or some core things that maybe I need to make sure to present in a certain type of way. Imagine if we viewed davening that way. Imagine if, 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 because it's true, every single day, there are things, some things are daily in our lives, some things are unique to that specific day, but every single day there are important things going on in our lives and we need to implore HaKadosh Baruch for his assistance. Imagine if we took a moment, not, not to then get caught up in stocks, that's the risk in all this, but imagine if we took a moment to collect our thoughts to prepare for this important meeting. The more, the more we see the hand of God in our lives through prayer, the more connected we are to him, the more meaningful the entire experience is, the more meaningful our religious lives are. So just my own two cents for whatever it's worth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And let's now proceed upstairs to the Vilanovsky Sanctuary. Obviously, men and women in their respective sections and uh, sections. And um, just when we're getting ready to start before uh, Shlomo starts, we'll say, now's the reflection time. And we'll give ourselves 60 seconds or so to get prepared. And then we'll start. But we're going to give you that little notice. Thank you. See you upstairs. Well, I'd like to say a different conversation. The intention is that we'll stay upstairs for the discussion if we can, but if it turns out that some people need more time to dog and we may come back down. But you can certainly leave your things here. Um, how about a lot of front doors so people can't just walk in and out and uh, we'll try to be secure in your day. No, my wife says, take your purse. All right. <laughs> Right, Stuart. Yeah, right. 